Hi, welcome to Offscript. I'm Zach Lewis. And I'm Dr. Draper. Today on the show, we are taking a look at Voyagers, the new theatrical film that's a little like Lord of, Lord of the Flies in space. It's not quite Lord of the Flies in space, but it's a bunch of teenagers in space. Uh, we went and saw it, and we're going to tell you what we thought of it. Uh, we also took a look at Hulu's The Clove Hitch Killer. It's a 2018 serial killer mystery film uh, that's surprisingly not that bad, and I'm excited to talk about what's going on in it and whether or not it's worth your time. We're going to take a look at some news. We've got listener questions we got to get to. We're going to look at a couple trailers that are coming up. A, 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 a cram show today, Andy, fully packed. A lot going on. Yes, and before we get to all of it, we need to get to the news. First things first, I just realized I started the show with the news on screen. By the way, if you don't watch the show live with us on Facebook, you can on our Facebook page at Offscript Film Review. First things first, the news. Warner Media CEO says that in 2022, Warner's movies will debut in theaters before they go to stream. This is obviously different from what they're doing now, which is pushing movies to HBO Max same day. Apparently next year, it's not going to be the case. Right, Andy? Yeah, so as we know, because of the pandemic, uh, there's been lots of experimentation with distri distribution and release strategies. And uh, one of those that HBO did or Warner Media did was hybrid release, where it was both on HBO and in theaters. That will all come to an end at the end of 2021. Going into starting in 2022, hybrid releases will be a thing of the past somewhat. I, th I think they're still going to be around a little bit, but for a lot of big tent polls, uh, they're not. And part of that uh, has to do with the deal that Warner Brothers made with Cineworld, which owns Regal Cinemas, which is the uh, actually the, the biggest uh, chain. Or is it the second? Um, I think there's a second. Anyways, they they have a de an exclusivity deal with uh, Warner Brothers Pictures uh, to release their films. So what it means is that the, the hybrid release, which we've been enjoying, um, will come to an end at, in about six or seven months. You know, there, there's two sides to this coin, right? There's the people who make the movies and there's the people who watch the movies. For the people who make the movies, I totally get this. Makes sense. Uh, you probably stand to gain a lot more money putting stuff directly in theaters first, shortening that 90-day window so we don't have to wait 90 days to get our movies uh, on streaming services, I think is smart. Like shortening that to, to a month and a half is sharp. I don't think that's a bad idea. I hope things still get pushed to HBO are in some similar capacity after that. But, you know, when Warner announced they were doing, when HBO announced, no, HBO, Warner Media, HBO, they're the same company, right? Uh, when they announced they were going to be kind of simulcasting all of their movies to go to HBO and theaters uh, this year, uh, a lot of movie like production houses that work with Warner Brothers were real mad. Christopher Nolan was big mad. He owns Syncope, uh, who makes all of their big movies over there. Uh, Lionsgate Pictures was furious with Warner Brothers because Lionsgate <laughs> is making Dune and The Matrix 4. And they're like, what do you mean our movies are going straight to people's homes? Like from the, from the money-making side of this, I get it. The consumer side, though, dude, it's a totally different story. I, I know. I, I love the hybrid release. And we've done both. We've seen things at home that, you know, we didn't feel warranted the theatrical experience. And then we did, like, we went and saw Godzilla vs. Kong um, and, and some others that we've done. So even though it is available at home, we've paid the extra amount to go see it if it's worth going. So it, it, it's been a, a great thing, and I really hate to see it leave. But I think it's... Bec you, you can't put it, the genie back in the bottle. I, I think once you've done it, it's still going to be an option. You know, maybe not for everything, um, but I, it it still could be there. You know, maybe for smaller films, independent films, things that maybe don't have a ton of buzz, or maybe things that are maybe, maybe like a foreign film, something like that. I sure hope so, man. I'm so I'm not into the idea of having to go wait like 45 days to watch movies, even if it's half the window it was. Getting stuff on HBO same day is awesome, and this is coming from the guys who go see movies. We still go see movies if we can. But like it, I just love the option. I love that I got to go see Godzilla versus Kong, and then I called my sister on the drive home, and she just finished watching it at home. Like it makes movies more accessible. It makes it more so more people can see things. We can have a larger conversation about this stuff. More people seeing more movies is a good thing. As a movie podcast, we're we're in support of that. So I hope they work this out. Also, one detail a lot of people are getting caught up on, and I'm still not sure I know the answer or Andy knows the answer for that matter. Are Warner movies going to be exclusive to Regal Cinemas, or is this all theaters? What's it, the deal look, it looks like they are going to be exclusive to Regal Theaters, which sucks because there's not a lot of them in, in our town. No. So we'll see. But I I can't imagine you're not going to make deals with the other other players. We'll we'll see what, what kind of happens. But that, that won't go into effect until 2022. 
Yeah, that that's that's a bit of this that's a little unclear. And when we find out more, keep it here on off script. We'll tell you where you're going to be able to see Warner Brothers movies in 2022. All right, so uh, subscribe, I guess, if you haven't. Our next story: uh, Mission Impossible, Top Gun, Snake Eyes. All these getting shuffled as Paramount decides they're going to be moving a bunch of movies that were supposed to be coming out this year just all over the place. But hopefully some of these are moving up, right? Movie theaters are getting open. Hopefully there's less delays, right, Andy? Yeah, um, as the pandemic is drawing to an end, uh, we are starting to see dates shuffle, and some of those dates are actually moving closer, but a lot of things are being moved back. In this case, Top Gun is moving to November uh, November 19th, 2021. Uh, it was supposed to come out in July, so it's moving from summer to fall. Uh, Mission Impossible 7 is going to come out next summer. Uh, it was, <laughs> it was going to come out in the fall of 21. Now it's going to come out uh, May in May of 22. And then some other notable ones is, uh, like I said, like you said, Snake Eyes, which is a G.I. Joe spinoff, is is moving back or is actually moving forward from October to July. So we'll get to see that a little bit sooner. The Dungeons and Dragons <laughs> film is moving back 10 months yeah! to March 3rd, 2023. Uh, so that's quite a ways. And there's a new Star Trek uh, feature, which will come out on June 9th, 2023. So we, we got a lot of things coming up some things moving forward some things moving back yeah um all exciting i think I'm, I'm glad it feels like we're opening theaters again in some capacity people can go see stuff i'm still bummed by things moving back to try to hit summer windows it is ridiculous to push mission impossible 7 back another year and change the movie's already made like it's been sitting on a shelf and frankly if mission impossible 7 is coming out in 2022 mission impossible 8 better be out by 2023 there is no excuse there's I no think, reason i can't I get tom cruise in space sooner <laughs> rather than later right i think i think that's actually right uh the third or whatever number uh seventh or eighth one is going to be out the following year so we're going to get back to back uh, mission impossible movies uh in 2022 and 2023 yeah it damn well better honestly so i don't know we'll see this is exciting there's actually dates there's a dungeons and dragons movie coming out i know there's 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 all kinds of cool stuff happening it's it's nice that we're seeing like not only the horizon for movies to come out that we already know of but also seeing new titles in here they got an untitled bg's movie they're talking about they got some john krasinski ryan reynolds feature that they're going to be starring in like i don't know what's coming up but it's exciting new things are happening and that's most important <laughs> especially like with some of this stuff kind of like wonder woman we've seen advertising for it forever like i've seen the top gun trailer so many times in, in, in <laughs> yeah. theaters it's and i we still got another six months of it so. yeah God, I was just working on something with a client yesterday, and they're like, that new Top Gun movie looks cool. I was like, what? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Top Gun's going to be great, sure, when it comes out in six months. I mean, my God. I'm glad movies are finally getting shuffled around. Our last story, Will Smith and Anton Fuqua pull slave drama emancipation out of Georgia due to restrictive voting law. Uh, Andy, why is everybody leaving Georgia? Well, as we said before, we're not a political show, but sometimes <laughs> movies and, and politics do mix. And um, recently there were a number of uh, voter registration laws or voter laws, which uh, many people have deemed to be uh, very restrictive and uh, embody kind of voter suppression and reminiscent of Jim Crow era laws to aim to keep people from voting. So because of that, um, a lot of people are beginning to pull out of Georgia production. And there's a lot of films, a lot of TV shows uh, filmed in Georgia. And so this is kind of one, the first big one to pull out uh, of Georgia. It's, of course, it's a, it's a big, um, you know, Southern epic about slavery. Will Smith is playing the lead. Antoine, Antoine Fuqua is directing. So it's a big film, big stars. They're pulling out. And so it, it kind of send, sends a message of like, you know, we're not, we're not going to support a state with these uh, kind of laws. And there's, a lot, again, lots of other shows. And we'll, we'll see if, if other people follow suit. Is it pronounced Anton Fuqua? It is, isn't it? I believe so, yes. Damn it. Okay, Anton Fuqua. I'll remember. All right. I said it wrong on the show. I'll never forget now. Yeah, uh, the story of emancipation sees Will Smith play, portraying a character named Whipped Peter, an enslaved person who emancipated himself from a southern plantation and joined the Union Army. Uh, it's based on a series of photographs that have uh, appeared in the issue of Harper's Weekly and then have been popularized since called The Scourge Back. You can find that online. Uh, I realize we could probably put it on screen on the show, but it's kind of it's kind of graphic. Pretty, it's and graphic. Frankly, I kind of forgot to get that ready to go, so I apologize for not featuring that on Facebook. Um, but this is, I, I think, 
probably a good thing. Um, you know, people underestimate how much stuff is made in Georgia when it comes to media. Besides hearing about like, uh, you know, Major League Baseball pulling their All-Star game out. Um, there is a ton of movies and television and streaming series and short films and video games that are made in Georgia. You'd be shocked how often you'll see that made in Georgia logo with, with the peach on it at the end of an AMC series like The Walking Dead or uh, on a video game you might be playing that's in a lot of movies now if you stick around till the end of the credits. It's surprising how much is made there. So I think this is a good thing, right? If 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 somebody feels disenfranchised and it's their right as a private business to say, Hey, I don't want to support this in this place. I, I don't want to be a part of this system and go somewhere else. Um, I'll be interested to see if other people follow suit, I guess. Yeah. I mean, th this isn't the first time uh, a production has pulled out of a state because of uh, controversial laws being in enacted. And so it's, you know, it's a way of, of peaceful protest. And um, yeah, like you said, we'll see who else, um, if anyone else does follow suit. Yeah. Like Andy said at the top, we are not a political show. Sometimes these things cross over. Uh, if you'd like, please do your own research on this stuff. And if you want to know more about what's going on uh, in the movie world, keep it here on Offscript News for more. Next up, we talk about our first film of the episode. Andy has graciously agreed to take the summary on this one. Andy, please take it away. Voyagers. So this is a new sci-fi drama uh, starring Ty Sheridan, Lily Rose Depp, and Fionn Whitehead from director Neil Berger. Um, and also starring Colin, Colin Farrell, of course, um, who I almost forgot about. Um, the premise of this film is there is Earth, Earth is is dying, destroyed, like in every sci-fi movie. Yep. And so uh, a mission sets out to colonize a new uh, far-off discovered planet. However, it's very far, and there is a generation of people who will need to live in space, and they <laughs> they will not actually make it to the destination. By the time they get there, they will be old and feeble. It, it's an 86-year journey. Um, Colin Farrell goes up with, with uh, students or the crew that have been raised from in isolation to, to about age, you know, 10, 12, something like that. And so the story kind of picks up with them as, as teens. Um, <laughs> sorry, as, as young, young teens with all the, the desires and urges that teens have. Um, when the kind of lead characters, Christopher uh, played by Ty Sheridan, uh, discovers that, that, they're being drugged to keep them domiciled. There, there's a drug they take called the blue. It keeps them, uh, keeps their urges in intact, keeps them from fighting, keeps them from wanting to have sex, these kinds of uh, things. Uh, so they decide they're not going to do it anymore. They're not going to take it anymore. Yeah. So it kind of unravels and, and becomes a little bit of a Lord of the, <laughs> the Flies uh, situation. But it's it, it's interesting, and it's a lot better than I, I thought it was going to be. I overall would say I, I enjoyed it. Um, so, Zach, what do you think? So I'm surprised at how much I enjoyed Voyagers. I, I actually I wrote it off as a bit of a mid-tier film, right? I was like, this is going to be okay. And it's not great. It's, it is not a great film by any means, um, but it's not that bad. There's actually a lot of, like, I, I, I got to the end of the film and was thinking to myself, like, I'm surprised at how much I actually enjoyed in this movie. Um, it's not a, I don't think this is a rush to the theater, see this film kind of situation, but if, when it inevitably arrives on a streaming service, it might be worth taking a look at. Where do you want to start talking about this monster? Um, well, let, let's get on with our, our plot, dig into the plot a little bit more. Yeah. Um, so we we have these these um, group of children who have been raised. Um, I mean, born from test tubes, like no no mother father. It's the kind of thing where they they choose the mother and and the father. It's like oh, this person's Nobel laureate, this person's a uh, award winning author, and then so that's kind of how they uh, grow the um, the crew. Um, and they raise them in complete isolation. Like they, they don't go outside. They don't go in the outside world. And yeah. then they eventually, you know, take off. And so it's completely isolated, um, which is really ethically <laughs> pretty uh, dubious. Um, but we just kind of sk skip over that. Um, and we meet our, our kind of main characters of uh, played by Ty Sheridan and Fionn Whitehead. They're kind of the the kind of they're they're the people in charge. One, one's like the the chemo the mechanical engineer one of them's something else you know everyone on the ship is like an expert in whatever medicine yes. farming 
Uh, that's right. Our, our, our 30 astronauts are very well equipped in everything going on in the ship. Everybody knows has has a job like yeah. Star Trek, right? Yeah, everybody's going to roll. Yeah, and and Colin Farrell is kind of the the matron for, for the, uh, lack of a better term uh, to go with them because they actually were supposed to just go without him, um, but he was like, no, these these, these kids they they need me. <laughs> um, so so he goes to k- kind of help monitor and raise them and be uh, you know a responsible adult in the midst of all of, of all this. But like I said, th- they eventually discovered that uh, par- part of their supplements include uh, a drug to keep them kind of domicile and uh, just not really have any feelings or emotion. And they begin to not take that. Yeah. So they very quickly established this kind of, uh, I-, I guess, internal form of government they have on this <laughs> ship with this 31 people because they very quickly decide, Hey, we're not going to take this blue stuff and there's nothing you can do about it. And Colin Farrell's like, yeah, that's true. Like he doesn't even try to fight him because he very quickly understands like, yeah, what, what am I going to do? Overpower 30 people on this thing. Like I can't make them do it. Like we have to get along on this ship and, and this long journey our our characters are all set on leaves them with this feeling of like wantonness and everything in their life because they'll never be able to run around outside and they'll never be able to see the open open sky and they'll never have all of these experiences so they very quickly start to develop this this feeling once they once they stop taking this drug that suppresses all of their emotions and mostly hormones because they're all teenagers very quickly start to realize like what's the point of 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 bothering like to with keep anything things going here <laughs> yeah like if if our only job is to be on here and keep the ship floating which it will do essentially regardless of if any of us are online because it's on course to hit this planet in 86 years or whatever mm-hmm. and we're all going to be artificially reproduced i guess like why do we need to do anything yeah who cares like what's what's going on in the ship why do we need to have our chores and do our jobs we don't have to do this and that's when you start to get this kind of unruly um, unrest in in our crew, and 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 our our we slowly start to divide into these subgroups of people who think, well, hold on, we should we should stay the course and do what we're doing. This is our mission. This is our job. This is why we're here. And other people are like, we decide why we're here. It's up to us to decide what what we're doing, what we live for, and what we don't. Like, no, we're we're going to do what we want. So you never get anybody who's saying turn the ship around by God, we're going back to earth. Like that never really happens. Everybody kind of stays on this idea of we, we have this mission. This is what we're going to do. But you do start to get some paranoia because you start to get some outside forces that, that make people wonder, hold on, are we really alone out here? Maybe there's something else in the ship with us. And then you start to get some really interesting kind of thriller, horror elements that are reminiscent of like, in its best moments, John Carpenter's the thing. Um, certainly not with any kind of like really cool special effects, but like the paranoia of, are you who you say you are? Are you on the blue or aren't you, you know, like the motivations become questionable and, and that makes for some good tension in this little bottle of a film. You're right. The, there are a couple of mysteries on the ship. Uh, I can't remember. Ty Sheridan's character discovers that there, yes. that there are the some um, hidden compartment or compartments that are not on their, kind of uh diagram manifest or, yeah, yeah blueprints in these like oh there's some hidden compartments here um you know and doesn't really get any answers to it there's also this creaking there's a lot of noise on the ship that can't really be explained which is also you know what is that where is it coming from um so there's a lot of mysteries that again fuel paranoia and uh distrust so it's a little bit of that um in, yeah just tension and, and paranoia in the background yeah, this all is set amongst some really solid performances. Um, like you said, we've, we've got a, a pretty solid cast of up-and-comers here. We're led by uh, Ty Sheridan, who is our lead as Christopher, Fionn Whitehead, who is kind of second fiddle, uh, supporting actor as um, Zach, his, his, his good friend, uh, who's got some difference of opinions on how things should be done on the ship, uh, played by Fionn Whitehead. You most recently saw him in Dunkirk or Bandersnatch on Netflix, if you watch that. It's good to see him in a role again. Lily Rose Depp plays the chief medical officer. Uh, her name is Sayla, I think. Yeah, Sayla. I got that right. I don't believe it. Uh, she's got an odd name. One, one of the few on the ship with a strange name. Most everybody's pretty easy to remember. But uh, daughter of Johnny Depp. It's exciting to see her in a role outside of a Kevin Smith movie because mostly, she's been, <laughs> I think most recently she was in like Yoga Hosers, which is one of his movies that he's done recently, I guess. Uh, she's surprisingly good in this movie. Uh, we've got Archie Matt 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 Mat
uh, is kind of a nefarious character. He's most recently in Midsummer. I forgot where he was, and I finally oh, figured yeah, it out. Oh, right. yeah, that's right. Yeah, he's he's one of the kids who shows up alongside our like main group in and Midsummer, disappear. and yeah. yeah, and 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 mysteriously disappears halfway through the movie. Um, Isaac Hempstead Wright from Game of Thrones, Brand the Broken, is in this movie. I I don't know why, but I, I what what is it you said? They're just trying to get out of. <laughs> <laughs> a game of thrones yeah um he's a, he's in this movie so you can say hey that's a kid from game of thrones because he yeah he, he doesn't have a very interesting or you know role or he's not no. super important but he's he, he has like 10 lines but he's movie. featured because so you recognize his face so yes it, like, the when broken, he's on screen he's all you're looking at yeah like because because he immediately draws your eye colin farrell is pretty solid as our uh patriarch and also special mention for uh vivek vivek Kalra? I, man, I really need to learn how to pronounce these names. Uh, he was the lead in Blinded by the Light, that Bruce Springsteen movie about the kid who grows up in London and like discovers Bruce. He's great. And he also doesn't have many lines in this movie, but I was excited to see him back. So like, I'm surprised by the up and coming star power. I feel like this would be one of those movies you can look back on IMDb in 10 or 15 years and be like, man, this movie had like five really good people in it. You know, um, solid casting. Yeah, the the cast is good. They're not given a ton to work with, um, but they know they do have some some scenes. There's eventually becomes infighting. Colin Fer Farrell's character kind of uh, loses his spot as, as commander, and, and the rest of the crew kind of has to, like you said, form form their own kind of this government and decision making. And, yeah. and there's uh, a lot of disagreement on how to kind of move forward with uh, the the mission. Right. Being that these kids are all um, completely, I mean, like test tube babies, like like born and bred in captivity. They have never left like the confines of what they believe is the space station. None of them have ever been outside. None of them have ever seen the sun. Like they are all like super odd little kids. Um, they're all presenting as particularly normal in this movie. They're, they're not particularly unrelatable. Once they kind of stop taking this drug, they all seem like pretty normal, even though Obviously, in reality, they would not be normal children at all. They would all be super weird and kooky. Um, but but the, the the infighting makes for some good tension. And I, I think the paranoia uh, starts to run deep because they don't understand a lot. I mean, about the world like they're not they're not normal kids at all. So when they think they hear something outside, they're like, what is it? Well, what could that possibly be? And somebody says it could be an alien. They're like okay well what what does that even look like <laughs> like we have no alien? idea yeah and then when they need to start deciding on things okay well how do we decide like they don't even know what a system of government is like as far as i know they don't understand like how a democracy functions <laughs> like how voting would work and everything is kind of told to them through this master computer it's a little like ridley scott's alien right like the computer knows all when they have a question and and they can't get an answer from colin farrell for one reason or another because they're off dealing with another problem the computer's like do this do that just just do this thing blindly follow instructions which is how they start to get in this area of well wait hold on what why do we have to say we should dictate the rules we're the ones on the ship by god we're the ones living we should say what, what we, we are the masters do. of our fate <laughs> Right. Now, the movie, I think, starts to falter in its presentation of these kind of larger ideas. You would think it would get into these big concepts of who are we and what what are we meant to do and what does it mean to truly live? And it kind of just touches those, it but it never it, yeah. it never really spends any time in it. I, I, I was thinking of movies like Robert Pattinson's High Life um, or even like George Clooney's The Midnight Sky, most recently uh, Netflix um and kind of drawing comparisons to those i think both of those movies kind of made a larger case for like life in what it means to be alive and this movie never really gets there it leans more into like the thriller side of things a little more a uh, little more sunshine by danny boyle a little less uh fun george clooney space mm -hmm. film i guess i wanted to get into the uh the sets and the set design yeah uh, this is one of the things that i think actually really made the film work for, for me is that the the interiors of the ship are really good it's this like stark everything is white very very clean very sterile looking uh you got everything's uh you have these monitors that have these giant screens uh so the the ship is really convincing as a spaceship and i think that's one of the things that it really helped sell the movie 
Yeah, I was just looking up who did production design. Looks like it was a man named Scott Chambliss who worked on Godzilla, King of the Monsters. Oh, and Star Trek. Okay. And Guardians of the Galaxy 2 and Tomorrowland. Okay, no wonder the sets look so good. Like, they got a super good set designer to put everything together. The film's directed by Neil Berger, uh, who most recently did Divergent. He did the first film in that series. He also did a couple other things. Limitless, the Bradley Cooper film. Um, It's not a movie that's particularly, like, helmed by an all-star crew or anything but andy's right like the set design is particularly striking because it just feels claustrophobic and it feels really maze-like and there's a couple spots where like you get a look at the overhead blueprints the manifests right especially when christopher's saying well hold on there's this hidden compartment over here what is this and colin farrell's character says well maybe we're not meant to know what that is maybe that's for the next generation you know maybe maybe that's not up up to us for decide um you never really get a sense of the layout of this place though it feels very maze like i would like it almost to the same kind of sense of unease you'd get from something like kubrick's the shining right like just just no a, orientation a, a maze, yeah. Uh, yeah like you never really get a good feeling for where you're at you may have characters running down one hallway and they'll bump into characters in another hallway and i don't I, I feel like that's by design. Yeah, nobody's ever going to diagram it out for you on screen. Nobody's ever like, well, here's exactly how the the mess hall connects to this. And I think that's not a bad thing. Yeah, it, it, it's purposely filmed in that way to hide the exact layout of the ship so they can make it seem really big. You know, there's extended sequences sequences where people are running through these these space hallways and it makes it look like the ship is just giant because there's like door after door after door and it's like they probably just had to run through the exact same um you know compartment several times to make it look really big uh so yeah you, you don't get a real clear layout of the ship but you have you know the mess hall the sleeping quarters so the command center of this this or that and it's it's, it's convincing enough not to like start asking questions about it you know, it's funny being a movie that's mostly helmed by young actors, right? Not quite child actors, but I mean, they're all early 20s, which I'm pretty sure in the story of the film, they're supposed to be like 16, like, I mean, 18, maybe they're not supposed to be that old. Yeah, they're and, all clearly and, adults. Yes. Like in the feature, <laughs> they are all clearly adults, but you know, whatever. I, who cares? Um you know, looking at the looking at the crew who put this movie together, the cinematographer uh, Enrique Chediak most recently did The Maze Runner and The Fifth Wave. Our director did Divergent. So we're grabbing people who have done sci-fi films starring kids. Like that's that's kind of our cast and our, that's kind of our crew. And I think that's wise for what this movie is doing. But ultimately, it does mean it falls a little short on any kind of like really strong theme. You don't walk away from this movie feeling like you really learned anything. It's kind of just like a nice popcorn filler of a movie i think and that's okay you know that that's not a bad thing but it does feel just a little lukewarm it doesn't quite hit this like high that i wanted there's some good mystery there's some good suspense except especially from the second to the third act there's actually some really compelling stuff going on but ultimately i just felt like it felt a little short right yeah it, like i said it starts to scratch the surface of some bigger ideas but never really dives into into them but it has enough in there for for me not to complain about no I agree. And ultimately, like if you're watching a movie in the middle of the in the middle of the spring, that's not such a bad thing. It's got a solid cast, got solid sets. It's a decent plot, right? It's not just Lord of the Flies in space. I know I keep saying that, but it's something more. And I think Voyagers, uh, well, it might, it might be worth recommending. Andy, you ready for recommendations? I am. Andy, would you recommend Voyagers? I would. Uh, I enjoyed it a lot. It's good sci-fi. It looks good. It's got a, an interesting premise. It has uh, good performances. Actors, you, you know, Colin Farrell, <laughs> actors you know, add Colin Farrell. No. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, he he's he's good in this. He's good. Um, yeah, he's fine. It 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 does begin to scratch the surface of kind of deeper questions, um, meaning of life or humanity and all these things. It doesn't really dive in into them, but that that's fine. It's not really th that kind of movie. It's not two thousand one. Um, but I, I I always enjoy sci fi. I always enjoy a movie in space, and um, yeah, I enjoyed it a lot. Highly recommend. Yeah, I, I'd recommend it with caveats. Uh, I would say, yes, Voyage is worth your time. I would say go wait till it's on a streaming service. You don't need to go to a theater yeah. to see it. It's not particularly cinematic. I know that was something that surprised me in Clooney's, in George Clooney's The Midnight Sky, is there's some sequences of like spacewalks and stuff that were really profound. This movie has a couple of those, but like you're not going to be hurt and watching it at home. It's not going to break your experience. It's not anything big and grand in scale. Like, it's smaller, it's more intimate, it's on a smaller budget. I think it's effective. They, they did a great job with what they did. Um, Voyagers. 
not 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 too shabby i think and with that we should move on to our next segment so we've got a, a unique something here i mentioned this at the end of last week's show uh we had a listener send in a question that i wanted to address and listeners uh you if you're listening or watching this can send in questions uh concerns complaints whatever you like uh to us at mail at offscriptfilmreview.com you can also comment on facebook when we're streaming the show live below you can dm us you can hit us up on twitter and instagram you can comment on youtube and we'll read your correspondence so like there's there's ways to engage with this but we got a question on twitter uh well well sent to us from a user on twitter uh jamal park at mapstone park on twitter uh annie do you want to read this thing or should i i, I don't mind i just feel like i've been talking a lot i think we can cut it down a little bit oh all right <laughs> well ex excuse me sir if you want to trim it please um well, the, the question is really a asking with COVID making uh, Warner move a lot of movies to same day streaming on HBO Max. Uh, do you guys see this as a way of competing or do you think Netflix has different goals? Because uh, Netflix has been buying some big properties like, lately, been making some big moves. Yes. Um, so they bought uh, the sequel to Knives, Kn Knives Out 2 and 3. They also made a deal with Sony to exclusively stream their films. Mm -hmm. um, so are they competing with HBO Max or have different goals? Zach, what do you think of that? So it's hard to know. I'm, first off, I'm glad we're talking about this in the middle of the show instead of just at the end because this was one that I wanted to sit on for a week and kind of simmer. So Jamal, thanks for your patience and thanks for writing in. Uh, I don't know what Netflix's goals are. I mean, Netflix's goals, I think, are, are are easily discernible. They're a business, right? They want to turn a profit. That's that's that simple. But as far as like producing a curated content library goes, I don't know. I don't know. You, he, Jamal makes a good point here. He mentioned in his his kind of long form question. He said that I care a lot. The Rosamund Pike film uh, made some waves because Rosamund Pike won a Golden Globe for it. Um, obviously Netflix has turned out some premium films in the past. Martin Scorsese's The Irishman is a great example. Um, Alfonso Cuarón's Roma was another tremendous example of things, uh, a film that is appearing at the Academy Awards in representation of Netflix. Like Netflix obviously is not afraid to fund large projects, but they also turn a ton, a ton of funding into mediocre projects. And that's why I'm not sure. I, normally I would say for somebody like HBO Max, yes, it is very clear HBO and Warner Media are trying very hard to make the premium content library on the internet. If you want good movies, if you want good television, damn good television, you're going to go to HBO Max. Everybody else, I think maybe Netflix has spent a lot of time trying to curate a large library to uh, appease multiple people. And it's only really now that I think maybe they're starting to pivot into premium stuff i've got more to say about it andy what do you think of that so far i think they see disney on the horizon um you know hot on their heels and they're worried because for the longest time netflix has mostly been a quantity over quality mm -hmm. approach and you know they've done some prestige films like roma and the irishman you know some of these bigger projects or they do things when it's around oscar time but they've by and large that they have a lot of mediocrity but they see that that's kind of hit his limit. And if they want to keep subscribers and get new subscribers, they got to have hot properties. And we've known this from the beginning. It's, it's all about the licensing. Um, Disney plus has come out swinging with, you know, a couple of hot Marvel shows later on WandaVision, Um, and right now Falcon winter soldier. Um, these are much better than the average, uh, TV show. And so I think Netflix is just seeing this and saying, you know, we got to do better. We, we got to buy, we got to have better properties we have to have a better reason for people to subscribe right uh, up until now netflix has been in many ways like the 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 uh, the, the blockbuster of streaming right like you, you think of renting movies if you're in america you probably think of blockbuster video that's what netflix has been um because they were the first big one they, they were the first one to really headline this idea that hey you can stream films online and it'll work and it'll be cinema quality or close to it for one low price every month but a lot's changed since then a lot's changed since netflix was kind of the only player in the game there are a ton of people making streaming services now freaking paramount pictures as their own streaming service nbc cbs disney apple hbo amazon has their own streaming service now that's just to name a few um, Netflix up until now, their strategy, I think has been just get as many people as possible in the tent, right? 
just cater to as many individuals as possible, not just in America, because they are a global company. There are other countries that they're managing. There are other content libraries where they have to deal with specific rights for countries in different places that they have to keep up with. Netflix is juggling an awful lot. They are spinning the most plates. But I do think Andy's right. They, they look on the horizon, they see Disney, they see HBO, and they go, oh, no. Um, the people who really care about movies, and not to say that people who don't care about movies and subscribe to Netflix, hear me out. I mean, the diehard fans, the, cine the cinephiles, the people who are really looking for premium content are going to start going elsewhere unless we do something different, unless we make a change. Now, I don't know how far that's gotten them. It's it's well known. Netflix typically does about two or three seasons of a show before they cancel it. So their content is not very long form. It doesn't last very long. They're, they're big on putting out new things that are bright and a flash in the pan and then moving on to the next thing. I don't know how long that bait and switch tactic is going to work. Um, I mean, we talked about on the show. Netflix for me and my house is is probably next on the chopping block for streaming services. <laughs> Um, it's close. I, I, it's it's close. It's between that and Hulu, and I know a lot of people who watch more Hulu than they watch Netflix. Like, I don't know. Um, I think this is oh, their way. So, so to the sh the short answer to the question, Jamal, uh, I think this is yes, their way of competing, definitely. But I also think Netflix, in a in a different way, does have different goals, and I don't know what that means for the future. Um, what yeah, do you we think, do. Andy? We do have to remember that Netflix is already global. Whereas a lot of these services are not yet. Um, Disney Plus isn't available everywhere yet. HBO Max is just now, I think, going to be available in the UK or available in other regions. So everyone still has a lot of catching up to do. And there's a lot of other places that don't need prestige uh, television or yeah. film. You know, a lot of their, like, you know, apparently Adam Sandler is very, very popular abroad. Um, so anything he does, uh, you know, really help, helps them. But they see that Disney is in in the year and a half they've been in, in the streaming business, they have half as many subscribers as um, Netflix. And that's a uh, absurdly short time. Yeah. And, and Andy makes a good point um, in mentioning Adam Sandler. It's worth mentioning in Netflix's mind, premium content does not necessarily mean Academy award winning it's eyes. It's how many people click on it. How many views does it get? Adam Sandler is not making, Academy Award winning films. Far from it. Very far from it. The most far from it. He's winning Razzies, for God's sake. <laughs> but he's also getting more people to click on Netflix content than many other creators. That's why he's getting multi-million dollar deals to travel the world with his buddies and shoot films uh, and, and make these things for Netflix. So, yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't know what that means. Like I said, I think Netflix absolutely wants to be a part of the conversation when it comes to prestige films, when it comes to competing with theaters, when it comes to being a platform for people to see premium content like we're talking about. But I don't think it's their priority. And I don't know what their priority is. And I don't know what that means for them. So, yeah. So Andy, <laughs> was that a good enough answer? That It was very I, not I believe... succinct at all. I took the longest way around to get there. No, I, I believe we will see. I definitely think Netflix de is trying to compete in in the co with prestige film because that's what the competitors are doing, and their competitors are getting good numbers and new subscribers, so they they have to try and keep up. Yeah, I just realized I had this banner down the whole time. That's okay. Uh, what I do have next is a couple upcoming trailers, some things that are coming out that we're excited to talk about on the show. And again, before I get too far away from it, Jamal, thanks for writing in. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks, man. Uh, this week we're talking about those who wish me dead and, and dude, I'm so off on the banners this week. Those who wish me dead and the new Zack Snyder movie. Andy, do you mind talking about those who wish me dead while I fix the stupid banner? Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, uh, here on the trailer park, um, those who wish me dead is a new film, uh, by Ty Taylor Sheridan, um, who famously did, uh, it's a writer for Sicario, uh, Hell or High Water and Wind River, uh, which I still haven't seen the third one. Uh, in great writer. Those are, are some really fine films. Uh, Those Who Wish Me Dead stars Angelina Jolie as a firefighter, forest fi forest firefighter who has uh, recently experienced some tra tragedy. She fought, it looks like she fought a fire, but lost some crew members along the way. Um, while she is out at a park doing what park rangers do, scouting whatever, she runs across a young boy who is uh, covered in blood. 
and uh, finds out that uh, some bad men are chasing him and and his father uh, with guns in in the park. Uh, so it's kind kind of a and she's got to keep him safe. So it's a kind of a count and mass cat and mouse game. Um, and eventually, one of these guys starts a forest fire, um, you know, to flush them out. And so Angelina Jolie, being the uh, experienced person she am, she is in this environment. Uh, vows to keep the boy safe and uh you know stop the bad guys um so i don't think this movie looks very good <laughs> <laughs> so i can explain uh taylor sheridan is worth talking about um because the guy makes some good stuff uh like andy said he's he's worked on some really fantastic films sicario in particular i'm a big fan of uh he's also co-wrote the show yellowstone for paramount which i hear is very good but it's not on any streaming service other than paramount streaming service so i'm probably not gonna check it out anytime soon but he's an up and comer in the industry. So if you're not familiar with Taylor Sheridan, it's worth mentioning that is primarily the big reason, at least I'm interested in what's going on here. Angela Jolie, I haven't seen in a movie in a long time. Um, I hope she's good. <laughs> she's going to be in Marvel's Eternals. So I hope she's still got her chops because I know it's been a minute and, and it's worth mentioning. Like I told, like I still landed for the show. She, in the meantime, when she hasn't been in film, uh, has been battling cancer, has been raising a family, and has been doing a ton of philanthropic work overseas. So I appreciate everything she's doing. I just hope she's still good. Meanwhile, the movie also stars John Bernthal as 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 beleaguered cop, who he plays a lot. We got <laughs> we got Aiden Gillen as very evil man, and then we got Nicholas Holt as pretty evil man but doesn't realize how evil things are until later in the film and then starts to think maybe i'm doing the wrong yeah, thing th this trailer does look very it's just generic. it's paid by numbers yeah, yeah. is what it is if, yeah if, if it had been anyone else attached to this well you know we wouldn't be even talking about it but uh because taylor sheridan has done such good work um i'm looking forward to this i think it's probably going to be more than what we see than what we see in the trailer the trailer's ma it's made to sell, sell the film so it's like here's the good guys here's the bad guys here's a forest fire like it's true it. and and the setting does look outstanding that's the one thing i the other thing i do want to mention the the whole fire watch like appeal is really fantastic this big tower nobody's around you're out in the middle of nowhere there's this kid covered in blood like there's some cool stuff going on there. Um, so I, I'm interested to see what's going on, but I'm a little skeptical. I'm going to be honest. I'm a little, I'm a little skeptical. It's, this it's also a May release and May, you know, May is a big month, even as we're coming out of the pandemic. So I, I think if it were a week film, it wouldn't come out at that time. Yes, this will but be I'm coming. For it. Th this will be coming to theaters and HBO Max on May 14th. Andy, you're going to watch this in theaters or at home? Probably at home. Is you see what I mean? Yeah, it's it's, it's, it's an at home HBO one. Well, but, well okay. because well because I could see like you know there's going to be some action. There's going to be the forest fire stuff will probably look cool on the big screen, but yeah, it's not Godzilla vs Kong. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. It's no Godzilla v Kong. That's true. <laughs> The next trailer we need to talk about is Zack Snyder's Army of the Dead. This trailer came out today, as of the day we we're recording this show, Tuesday, April 13th, 2021. Boy, oh boy, have I been excited to see this trailer. The movie stars Big Dave Batista, along with a host of mercenaries who were hired to infiltrate a zombie-filled, desolate Las Vegas strip to get $20 million out of a bank vault. I think 200 million? I think it's like 200 million. I think it's even more. Yeah, right. Uh, and and escape hopefully unscathed. They are given all the weapons and supplies they are need. They need to fight a literal army of the dead. Millions, it appears, of zombies in this trailer. Boy, oh boy, does this look like a fun action romp? What do you think, Andy? You know, after seeing Zack Snyder's uh, Justice League, uh, I think this looks right at home for him. Like Zack Snyder can make good, fun films. I think he just has to be doing the right property, and the zombie genre is right up his alley. Um, lo lots of action, of course. We got, uh, like you said, big, big Dave Bautista, who, who's slowly becoming an action star. Um, a lot of other people I don't recognize. It's got a good premise. And the, the only thing that annoys me is that apparently the, the zombies are like getting smarter and they're organizing. And I was joking. Yeah. They're, they're going to have democracy before, before long. <laughs> yeah, They're going to start voting. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, the trailer looks the first, the first third of the trailer looks kind of cool. It's like, all right, there's the setup. The second, the, the, the next third of it looks kind of lame. All right. They're all kitten up. They're going to go to this heist thing. The last bit of it looks fantastic. They're in Vegas. They got to go get the money. I don't know what happens next. There's a ton of zombies. The, the one thing that did stand out, like Andy said, is, is they point out that the zombies are now smarter. Uh, you're not, dude, zombies don't need to be smart. 
they don't they don't need it it's counterintuitive to what they are zombies are supposed to be hungry and they're supposed to be mad and they're supposed to be fast and ravenous and they're supposed to overwhelm you with in numbers and strength they don't need to be smart zombies don't have to outsmart anybody that's that's the, we, you don't need it you don't need it um i am excited to see this one i think it looks pretty fun i don't i can't say it looks good uh because there's a lot that the trailer doesn't show i think like those who wish me dead um I don't know. Yeah, well, I guess we'll see. Army of the Dead, um, a fine, fine return to form for the director of Dawn of the Dead in two thousand four. Oh, here we are, mm-hmm. this many years later, and that's um, that's going to be out on Netflix on May twenty first. Yeah, I, is, that, is that coming to theaters too? I, d- I doubt it's Netflix. That's a shame. I was going to say because that one seems like a good theater sized feature, but I don't know. Maybe Zack Snyder always he demands the silver screen. By God, <laughs> we'll, we'll get to the Snyder cut of this. His grand, his grand, right? The Snyder cut of Army of the Dead. Jesus. All right. Well, we've got one more movie to talk about before the show's over. I'm excited to talk about the summer for this one. The movie is The Clove Hitch Killer. So the Clove Hitch Killer was recommended by a listener. Two listener recommendations in one episode. I know there's a lot going on. Uh, Jordan Sutton, an old college buddy of mine, reached out to me and said, "Hey Zach, uh, I know you guys don't do series." I'm hoping you can watch this series for the show. And if not, can you watch this movie? And I said, we don't do series, but we can check out this movie. The Clove Hitch Killer came out in 2018 and is currently available to stream on Hulu. I told Andy about it. He was like, I've never heard of it. I said, well, it's got a 77 on Rotten. How bad could it be? <laughs> right? Like it starts, it stars Dylan McDermott. It's unrated. Maybe it's okay. Uh, initial impressions of Clove Hitch Killer are not strong, but there's some stuff going on in this movie that might be worth your time. Uh, let me explain. Clovich Killer tells the story of Tyler Burnside, a Boy Scout in a very evangelical town. He's a volunteer at his local church. He's the dutiful son of an upstanding community leader dad in this quiet Kentucky town. Uh, but there's some things going on on the surface. See, things aren't so normal in this quiet Kentucky town. There's actually been a string of murders over the years. Uh, horrific serial killings. Women tortured, tied up. You, all kinds of stuff. Uh, and when Tyler discovers uh, a, a small cache of strange photos and erotic material in his dad's work shed, he starts to suspect that maybe his fun loving Boy Scout father isn't the all American hero he might think he is. Uh, it is a serial killer mystery, a return to form for the serial killer mystery, according to film school rejects. Uh, I'm not so sure. Andy, what did you think of the Clove Hitch Killer? Uh, so like I said, I, I didn't like the, the first 15, 20 minutes uh, of this movie. It just seemed really low budget, but it did get better the longer it went. And, you know, it, it's not an entirely original premise. You know, uh, someone suspects their family member or someone they know is a, is a serial killer. Um, but it does kind of dive into deeper issues of like family and, and community um, because it, that's kind of utmost important in this in this town is like what people what everyone thinks of you and what everyone thinks of your family so you know it's it's kind of this question is if there is a serial killer in your family how do you take care of that but also not you know bring shame upon yourself yeah i was surprised at the kind of purview this movie takes because rather than being this like story of of a, of a kentucky town that comes together and 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 says no that this, this wonderful man in our community can't be who you think he is no he's a good guy and then it slowly turns out he is instead it screws way down and it focuses on the view of the son who is the oldest son in the family has a younger brother is normally a quiet kid who just kind of stumbles on this horrifying thing like just completely unintentionally and suddenly has to sit with this idea that like, hey, you might want to investigate here because like there's a lot that doesn't check out about what you think your dad is doing and you need to figure it out. Um, the movie is. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, yeah, what's a little bit different here. And I don't think this is a spoiler. We learned very early on that uh, Tyler is right about his uh, who he thinks someone in his family being uh, a serial killer. That's not like we find that out by the end of, of act one. And so it's not, not a question of is he, or isn't he? It's like, he is, what do we do now? What do we do about that? Right. The, the trailer makes that very clear as well. Like it's, it's pretty clear. Dylan McDermott is the father. He's the only real name in this movie outside of the lead, Charlie Plummer, who plays Tyler Burnside has been in a couple features. Um, Dylan McDermott does a really great job of playing this character. I didn't quite get like lost in the role, but he's got this goofy, 
like Midwestern accent. He's got this big fat beer gut. You can see hanging out of his stupid boy scout uniform. And like, he's got these glasses and he just checks all the boxes for like complete loser dad. Right. <laughs> like nothing like, awkward. He's not funny. Like he just like, he really feels like, you know, generic American dad, man. Um, and to find out, Hey, something may not be right about this guy. Uh, really brings in a sense of unease into the film because the movie is presented in this really kind of stark format, similar to, uh, well, hold on. I'm starting to talk about cinematography. I I'm wandering. Andy Dylan McDermott's good in this movie, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, he's, first of all, he definitely, as soon as you see him, you're like, yep, he's, he's a killer. Uh, <laughs> but also, uh, yeah, I mean, he's fine because he, he has to play, uh, again, this uh, kind of against type, this super, religious evangelical father um and, and boy scout leader and you know that's one of the things very important to him is like that you're that his son is um not only like you know a person of the face but also the faith but also th that he's a handyman that he knows how to you know do boy scout stuff tie tie knots and like help out you know has him helping out around the house fixing this fixing that like he's a handyman uh by trade which is actually part part of the reason part of what comes in handy is being be a serial killer too but you know he he's an upstanding citizen in the community and everyone thinks very highly of him yeah and and i think that that's played uh very alternatively against the cinematography now's my chance to talk about it, which is striking uh, this movie's directed by Duncan Skiles, who before now has done like comedy television. He doesn't work with Reggie Watts. He hasn't. This is his first feature and only feature as of uh, this recording. Uh, this movie's very distinctive in its presentation. I think he took a lot of inspiration from David Fincher's Zodiac. The camera is constantly locked down on a tripod. Very intentional shots. Not a whole lot of handheld. Not a whole lot of movement. Everything feels very particular like well, we're going to shoot this scene this way and shoot it from here and then shoot this way and from here a lot of long takes um very intentional very surgical is how this movie feels very clinical very very clean and i think it does come off feeling a little cheap that way because this kentucky town looks exactly like a kentucky town which is like midwest americana nothing special about this place um it doesn't feature any like rolling vistas and have any really great landscapes or architecture. Like it just looks very plain. And that combined with the cinematography, at least through the first like 25 minutes of the film just comes off boring. It's just like, nothing's really happening. This isn't really going anywhere. This is really dull. Our characters are uncharismatic because that's why they would be in this town. But when you start to kind of dig into this mystery of what's going on, you really start to uncover some of the darkness. Like you get into some good, some good pulp, some decent thriller content and, and a great setup for a surprising twist in the screenwriting, which I didn't expect. Right. And I also wanted to mention, uh, Tyler has, uh, kind of a, a sidekick, uh, girl he meets, uh, named Cassie played by Madison B uh, Beatty. Who's, uh, kind of a, like I said, she, she's an outcast from the, like, she's not religious in a very religious town. She kind of has a bad reputation. Now a lot of people gossip about her. Um, but she ends up being one of Tyler's only, only friends and a person that he can confide in, um, about this and who kind of comes along in this, uh, very dark Hardy boys style mystery. Right. Cassie is our connection to the actual like string of murders because before then, you know, Tyler had heard about, okay, there were these murders in town, didn't really know a lot about them. She, meanwhile, is like an, an enthusiast. She's got this morbid curiosity. She's a high school girl. She's like, I want to know everything about this guy. The cops couldn't figure it out. I bet I can. He's still out there. We got to get, we got to get going on this. She starts to kind of bridge those gaps for him and say, hey, this thing you found kind of looks like this thing that happened a couple of years ago here. Um, and starts to help unravel that mystery a little bit. Um, what's surprising, I think, is the quality of the writing. The directing felt sterile. It felt cold. It felt like somebody who was doing their first feature, and it's very intentional. It's not bad, but it, it it's a little lacking. The writing, however, this movie's written by Christopher Ford, who most recently wrote Spider-Man Homecoming and written a handful of other features as well. Additionally, he brought over his editing team. His two editors uh, also edited this film who came from Spider-Man Homecoming. So we're talking about theatrical blockbuster quality writing and editing the directing's a little lame and the casting doesn't quite get there but there's still a lot in this movie that works it's very effective it's got good suspense um and like i said i, I was surprised by the ending i did not see it coming in the fashion that it did right it, right it definitely while, while it has a lot of the staples you're familiar with in the kind of 
serial killer genre uh, it definitely takes a lot of different uh, turns and approaches yeah and i i i think that's a good thing i mean obviously i i can say confidently i enjoy watching good movies uh, having done 139 episodes of off script um but this was one that like really was off the radar i really didn't hear a lot about it. according to wikipedia this movie made just over six thousand dollars in its united states premiere it's like nothing. Wow. Um, yeah, nothing. Uh, that covered no one's salary. <laughs> yeah, and, and if this hadn't been available on Hulu, I likely would not have watched it. I probably wouldn't have paid six bucks to watch this on premium VOD or whatever. Um, I, you know, I, I guess this is one of those films that I'm, I'm glad I had the opportunity to see. I'm fortunate that we got around to it, but I'm not surprised I missed it either. It's it's a movie that is not brilliant, uh, but it's not bad. And and there's something going on in here that's worth talking about at least. There's a reason it's got a 77 on Rotten. Um, you know, a lot of, a lot of blockbuster films that come out this, these days don't have that. Right, and it's uh, I will say it's a little long in the tooth uh, yeah. for for what it is. It could probably cut 10, 15 minutes. Um, but other than that, it's fine. Yeah, and it is also at least the first act is is very slowly paced, too slowly I think. Uh, real hard not to get your phone out. <laughs> <laughs> it picks up the day gets it gets going but you gotta you gotta be on for that initial kind of bumpy ride uh to get you through to the goods uh andy are you ready for recommendations i am andy would you recommend the clove hitch killer so i would say save it for streaming it, it which it already is um if you're into the serial killer genre fan of dylan mcdormand uh, and or subscribe to, to Hulu. Um, I think it's definitely w worth your time because, like I said, it is a little bit uh, of a different approach to this kind of well tread genre. Yeah, it, it really is. It, it I think draws inspiration from. Okay, well, first off, I would say recommended for streaming as well. Yeah, it's available on Hulu. You should go check it out. It tries to follow in the footsteps of I feel like a Fincher film, like a very intentional, very calculated kind of production. It doesn't quite get there. But it's a solid first outing for Duncan Skiles, the director. It's a solid outing for Dylan McDermott and Charlie Plummer. Um, this is not a bad movie. It's really not. I, I'll, I'll probably keep up with what these people are doing in the future. Um, Clovich Killer, not that bad. Surprisingly good. You should go check it out. And with that, we are at the end of our fair episode. Andy, what are we watching next week? Well, we're going to take next week off, actually. But when we come back, we're going to come back in hot with uh, Mortal Kombat on the which Ooh. comes out April 23rd. Dude, I cannot wait to lay over just a bit of that Mortal Kombat track on the intro to that episode. <laughs> like we be started talking about it. Oh my god, you got it. I know they released uh the new Mortal Kombat like version of the song. Have you heard it yet? Yeah, I have. The movie. I listened to like a second. I was like, you know what? I, I want to see it on screen. I don't want to it's not going to be the same. I don't want to ruin it for myself. Yeah, it's, it's like when they dumped Adele's like Skyfall theme before it came out and in the movie. And I was like, I'd rather just watch it in the Bond intro in the James Bond film it's going to be featured in, like than listening at home, whatever. Yes, we're going to be taking a look at Mortal Kombat. I'm excited to get into that. In the meantime, we will be taking a week off. Much deserved, in my humble opinion. <laughs> That's right. Uh, if you enjoyed the show today, you can follow us on Facebook at Offscript Film Review to see live episodes every single Tuesday evening, except next week because we're off. Uh, you can follow us on iTunes and Google Play and Spotify and iHeartMedia and anywhere else you get your audio podcasts. Our full episodes go to YouTube as well. And you can follow us on there at Offscript Film Review on Twitter, on Instagram. You can find us there. And you can also email us at mail at offscriptfilmreview.com. You can mail, email us with correspondence, questions, concerns. You can hit us up with a big question like Jamal, or you can hit us up with a recommendation like Jordan. I don't know. Let us know. Right into the show. We'll read your correspondence on the air, usually. Uh, with that being said, any am I missing anything? I think it covers everything. Right? No, I think that's it. Very absent minded this week. From all of us at Offscript, the home of Bolt Cinema, I'm Zach Lewis. And I'm Dr. Draper. Thanks for listening.